Amen. Okay, go ahead and keep your place there in Romans chapter 12. So here we are, 12 chapters in. Romans chapter 12. So keep your place in Romans chapter 12. There's a lot of different things covered in Romans chapter 12. I'm going to try to capture um, the main uh, theme of the, of the chapter tonight, if I've done my job. Turn to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, while you keep your place in Romans chapter 12. And I'm just going to get right into it and start off with verse number 1, where the Bible reads, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In 1 Thessalonians, go to chapter number 4. Chapter number 4. So why is this preaching, all of this preaching, you know, important? Is what we're, we're talking about in the first couple of verses here. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And he says that, you know, he wants you to, to conform to that perfect will of God. So what is that? Look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse number 3. And it will give us a clue. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Then he goes on. But he basically says this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So we know from previous chapters um, and previous sermons that we've preached here, that I've preached here, that the will of God is that all men would be saved. All men would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But here we say that even further than that, the will of God is that you would be sanctified. You would be sanctified. You would walk in the Spirit, you would, you would do the things that God commands you even after salvation, okay? So that's why, you know, that's your duty as a Christian, is what verses number one and number two um, say here. Ephesians number four says, you know, for the perfecting of the saints. That's why God gave preachers and teachers and evangelists, right? So, you know, that's why you have, you come here and you hear me, you know, yell the Bible at you, so you can be perfected. Amen. So you can be sanctified, is what the Bible says. You know, and, the, and, and I like how, how Paul words this in verse number one, where he says, I beseech you, he says. So that's why, you know, I'm up here and I'll get excited sometimes and, and, I'll, and I'll get passionate about certain things because I'm, I'm beseeching you. Amen. To beseech you means I'm trying to compel you. I'm trying to wake you up. You know, that's what Paul, Paul is, is begging them. He's saying, I beseech you. He's trying to compel them to be sanctified. And, and for, for what reason? So you can be this awesome Christian? So you can say that you, you've, you've done it, and you're the, you're the best, and you've figured out the Bible, and you've got your life together? No, because it's your reasonable service, Amen. he says. It's, it's what's just expected of you as a saved believer at the least, is what that means. So I beseech you to be sanctified because it's your reasonable service. And when you look at what God has done for you, it makes perfect sense that you would at least attempt to sanctify your life. Right? Right? So that's what Paul's talking about when he's beseeching them. He's trying to compel them. It's your reasonable service. Flee fornication. Learn the Word of God. Practice these principles in your actual life. Be doers of the Word and not hearers only, Amen. is what he's talking about. And we could go on and on. You know, to not be conformed to this world, which is the opposite of the things that you will hear preached you know, from this pulpit. Be not conformed to the world. It's your reasonable service. It's the least that is expected of you. So think about that. Look down at verse number 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think. So don't think that if you start to sanctify your life that you are suddenly some wonderful Christian. It's just your reasonable service. He's continuing that thought. But to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Remember that statement. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, 
and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So we see there's a measure of faith, and then there's a proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. I could go into all these different details, but I want to capture the main theme of these verses right here. When he's talking about you know, these, these differing gifts. We all have different gifts. The Bible's teaching us here. We don't all have the same gifts. And thank God. Because the church wouldn't need you know, 20 pastors. The church wouldn't need you know, uh, everyone to be an usher. The church wouldn't need you know, everyone to serve in the AV ministry. Things like this. I mean, a church, the body of Christ, needs all different gifts. And that's what God has provided. He's provided men, women, with different gifts, is what he's saying here. And it's by the measure of faith, or the proportion of faith. Now, what, what in the world does that mean? Does anyone know? Because I don't know. Now, let's look at it, okay? Let's figure this out. What does this measure of faith or proportion of faith mean? Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to look at this. So it says that these gifts are given to you in a certain measure, okay? By a certain measuring stick, basically, is what it's saying. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verse number 7, we're going to go all over uh, the Bible tonight. I'm sorry to do that to you, but I'm not really sorry to do that to you. Amen. Ephesians 4, 7, the Bible says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So if you're saved tonight, you have enough grace from God to get to heaven. Amen. Okay? You have enough if you're saved. If you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have enough grace to get you to heaven. All right? Turn to Ephesians uh, chapter 2 and verse number 8. You probably don't even need to turn there. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. If you're saved tonight, you have at least enough faith to get you to heaven. Okay? You have at least enough. So your measure of your faith, if you're saved, is at least enough to get you to heaven. That's the promise that God has made you. Okay? Now turn to James chapter 2. The Bible says that you can increase, you can improve on this faith. You can improve on it. So, let me ask you a question. If I measured your faith today, I, I, if I had a measuring stick for your faith, and I measured it today, and then over the next two months you improved on it, and then I measured it again, would, would it measure the same? No, it would measure different. It would be a different measurement, right? Look at James 2 and verse 22. What does the Bible say? See thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. So you have enough faith always, if you're saved, to go to heaven. But you can make your faith perfect. And how do you do that? Your faith, wrought with your works, becomes more perfect, is what the Bible is teaching. So your works matter to make your faith perfect. We've gone through this in James chapter 2 already. So we know that God gives us different gifts. And we know that those gifts are measured out by this measure of faith or this proportion of faith. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's look at this, these, these gifts in a little bit more detail. All right? I want to throw a number of concepts out there and then we'll wrap them up together. Okay? In Romans chapter 12, we see this diversity of gifts. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And start in verse number 4. In Romans chapter 12, it says in verse number 6, having then gifts different according to the grace that is given to us. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 4, the Bible says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. So now we see another concept thrown in on top of this. Okay, stick with me. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. 
And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. He's talking about all these different gifts. Okay? He's talking, he's going to go through different gifts, just like he did in Romans chapter 12. And he's saying, but for one is to given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, that's a gift, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But to all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So, once again, we're all these different members of the body of Christ, and we have all these different gifts. But in 1 Corinthians, we see that these gifts are administered by the same Spirit. Capital S. That's the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we know that if you're saved, you have enough grace to get you to heaven. Grace is the mechanism God is, it's the, it's the characteristic of God that he uses to give you the gift of eternal life. Okay, let's be clear about that. But we know that if you're saved, you have enough faith. Regardless of your works, we know that you have enough faith to get to heaven. You have enough of it. If you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, your gifts that God has given you are revealed through the Spirit, is what 1 Corinthians is telling us, by your measure of faith, if we tie that into Romans chapter 12. So as you strive to make your faith perfect, what I'm trying to get you to understand, your faith is directly proportional with this Spirit in you. Okay? So at, the one thing you can control in your life, the Bible teaches, the one variable that you have to play with is your faith. And how do you play with that? With your works. Your works rot with your faith, and they make it perfect. They make it stronger. And as that faith gets stronger, the Spirit gets stronger in you. You see? See, let's look at the Spirit in your life. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Say, I don't believe you. You just made that up. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. So right now, just like you have enough grace, you have enough faith, you have enough of the Spirit to get you to heaven. No matter what. If you're saved, you have enough of the Spirit to get you to heaven. Because God has put a down payment, he says, of the Spirit on you to get you to heaven. In Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. But let's keep going. Which is the earnest, the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So as your faith increases, your spirit will increase. You have enough of the spirit to be saved because God put a down payment that He used to seal you that's the earnest of your salvation. And that's a proof of eternal security, by the way. Amen. Because God's not going to abandon His Holy Spirit. He, he's going to, you know, come back for it. it. God has actually sealed you Himself. Okay? Turn to Acts chapter 11. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is as you, will be, you will be, as you perfect your faith, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit, is what the Bible teaches. Look at Acts 11 and let's look at this. Let's see how... Your faith and the Spirit are tied together. Acts chapter 11, look at verse number 22. Then the tidings, this is talking about Barnabas. Then the tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church that was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came, he had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. So you see how Barnabas, his, his being filled with the Holy Ghost or being full of the Holy Ghost was directly proportional with his faith. Yeah. 
and the strength of his faith. You see how that works together? So if you have this variable in your life that you can control, and you say, hey, I want you know, the Holy Spirit in my life to have power to fill me up and to give me power in my life, well, perfect your faith. That's what the Bible's teaching. And you can control that through your works. Okay? Now, go to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's look at this a little bit more. Let's look at being filled with the Spirit for a couple minutes. So faith and the Spirit go together. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 18. We'll see more proof of that here. The Bible says, And be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but on the other hand, be filled with the Spirit. So he's talking about works which will perfect your faith, and if you get your works right, in this case it's alcohol and being drunken, if you get your works right, you will be filled with the Spirit. Amen. You see? You see how the works here will rot with your faith, make your faith more perfect, and you'll be filled with the Spirit. Isn't that wonderful? Acts chapter 9. Let's look at more people being filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 9, verse 17. This is when Paul has lost his sight, or Saul has lost his sight. And the Bible reads in verse 17, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou comest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So Paul was a man of pretty strong faith. We know that. And we know that Paul, throughout his life, was filled with with the Holy Ghost. Now here's what's interesting. Turn to John chapter 3. Let's just look at an interesting um, point here real quickly. John chapter 3. Let's look at Jesus and what kind of measure Jesus had of the Spirit. Because we're given these things by measure, the Bible says, and it's dependent on how perfect our faith is. Are you following me on this? But let's look at Jesus. John chapter 3 and verse 34. The Bible reads, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the, speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. Jesus had it all. Amen. You see, nothing was given by measure to Jesus. Jesus had all of the Spirit. All of it. He did not have to perfect anything, because he... He was God. He was God in the flesh. Look at John chapter 4. You say, that's one verse. Let's get another one. John chapter 4. I mean, it makes perfect sense. But it's just interesting that you know, the Bible just details all these things for us. John chapter 4 and verse number 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He wasn't being filled. He was full, the Bible says. Now, Turn to Acts chapter 7. Certain men in the Bible achieved this fullness in their life. Certain men in the Bible achieved what the Bible details as being full of the Holy Ghost. I want to point out one instance in Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. This is the story of Stephen right before he is killed. Stephen, of course, preaches this great sermon, and then he is uh, executed afterwards. And if you look down at verse number 55, right before he's about to be killed, the Bible says, but he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, so he starts talking. He's full of the Holy Ghost and then he speaks. I want you to remember that. He says, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God and they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. This was later to be Paul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. Notice what he says. Notice what he says. He doesn't say, God, get me out of here. God, please make this stop. God, 
take me out of this horrible situation. Look what he says. Right now, this man is full of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. And he says, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. His last words were to try to get God to, to not lay this sin upon the people who were actually killing him with stones at the time. But he was full of the Holy Ghost. Now here's what I think is interesting. Turn to Luke chapter 12. Here's where I'm going with this. Here's what I think is interesting. If you read stories of the martyrs in books like Martyr's Mirror and, and other accounts of either the apostles, because they all died horrible deaths. And you read, read stories about you know, the martyrs throughout the, the history of you know, the Roman persecution and the Catholic Church persecution, and you read these things. You know, when I think about the brutality, and I won't list it for you now, but those books detail the brutality of what happened to those men and women. And there was a part in Martyr's Mirror where it basically said something along the lines of the ways that they would torture people and kill people and break people's bodies, it's as if, it, it's as if the creativity of man was, was run out because they got so creative and so sadistic in how they could inflict pain and everything. And when I think about those men, and I think about the accounts of those situations, and women, by the way, when I think about the accounts of those situations, I think about, man, could I go through something like that? One of the things that, that would cross your mind is, boy, I hope that I wouldn't deny Christ, or I hope I wouldn't scream out in pain or, or say something that is against my Lord and Savior in those weak moments. But none of those men did and none of those women did. They went through all those things and as they were on their last breath and they were being burned to death or they were being flayed alive or they were being boiled or they were being cooked slowly or whatever it was, they, they refused to recant the Lord Jesus Christ. And look down at, at Luke chapter 12. And the Bible gives us the answer on, on why that is. That's not because they were ex exceptionally tough people. It's because God helped them. And if you look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 11, the Bible says, And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and the powers, take ye no thought how or what things ye shall answer or what ye shall say for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. And I believe that all those men that were saved and that were killed for Christ were, were full of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost brought them through those moments. Just like that's why we have the account of Stephen in the Bible. And that's why Stephen, to his last dying breath, said the words that he said. Instead of crying out for himself or making make it stop or anything like this, he you would think that one person would get in the flesh. We have the flesh until we're, we're dead, right? You would think one person out of these martyrs would get in the flesh and say something stupid, but no, all of them is documented. They, just would, they would not deny Christ, and they said things like Stephen said. You know, lay this not to their charge. And the people, it, and, and you know why God did this? Because the people who were in those courtrooms and watching those executions, they couldn't believe it. They're, I mean, it's documented. The people stood around and people were getting saved watching that. I mean, uh, James got his executioner saved and they both got executed together. That's why God did it. Not only to comfort us, but as a witness to others. He will fill us with the Holy Ghost. We don't have to worry about that. So, you know, things aren't bad here, right? No one's chopping our heads off here. But if they do, who cares? Because we're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost at that moment. And the best words that I ever say in my life will be at that time that come out of this body. They won't be mine, but the best words that come out of this body before it's dead, if I'm executed for Christ, will be at that time. Because of, I will be filled, I will be full of the Holy Ghost. That's what God promises me. Isn't that wonderful? We don't have to worry about it. That's just another reason that all we have to fear is God. 
Forget everything else. The only thing that you have to fear in this life is God. Nobody else can do anything to you. That's the bottom line. So, a little bit of a rabbit trail there. So, conclusion. Why do your works matter? You know, you have this variable of faith in your life, folks. You have this variable of faith. We have this measure of faith that we can and should strive to perfect. You can do it. It's something you can change by your works. By learning the Word of God, by listening to the Word of God, by coming to church, by separating from the world, by fleeing from fornication, all these different things. We could go on and on and on and on. And by this, we'll be filled with the Spirit because our faith is directly proportional with the Spirit in us. And then, then, we will realize the full potential of the gifts that God has given us. That's what the Bible's talking about here in Romans chapter 12. All right? Now here's a bonus. We all, have, we all have different gifts, and I mentioned that, but that's what's needed in a church. And I'm glad that the Bible talks about the diversity of gifts because, honestly, the hardest part of starting this ministry here was the very beginning when we didn't know who was going to be in the church and we didn't know who was going to be able to help with anything. We didn't know who was going to come to church because we had to do everything ourselves. I don't want to do everything myself. I'm not good at everything. So it's nice to have people with this diversity of gifts that's one body. It's nice to have people stepping up with their gifts and realizing their gifts and growing their faith to realize those gifts even more. And as you grow your faith, I guarantee you will find gifts because you'll notice that in these gifts, it was gifts of prophecy, gifts of, of the Spirit, gifts of, of, of faith. You will notice that there wasn't really gifts of AV ministry. There wasn't really gifts of, of vacuuming the floor. These gifts that you have, I'm telling you that you people in this room, you, there are gifts you don't even know you have. And as you perfect your faith, you will realize those gifts. And I wish going out soul winning that I could get this across to people. I wish I was better at this. I want to get better at this. I don't know if it's a gift that I have, but I want to get better at this. I want to get better at going and giving somebody the gospel and explaining to them and beseeching to them. Hey, whatever your name is, you have a number of gifts inside you that you don't even know exist. And now that you're saved, if you can perfect and work on this faith, you will realize those gifts. How many times do you think we are walking past and giving the gospel to the next great preacher or the next mother of the next great preacher or the next great evangelist or the next great person who's going to help with all the things that need to be helped with in this church? The next, just a next great soul winner. I mean, I, it's something I think about a lot. What could I possibly say to those people to get them to realize that you have this pile of gifts inside you and you don't even know they're there? And as you perfect this faith, you will start to realize that they're there. And God forbid that any of us here don't realize the gifts that God has given us because you're in a position where you can start perfecting your faith. So move on that. All right, back to Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. That means without concealment. Abhor that was e which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Verse number 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another. In honor preferring one another. Your friends should be here. One another. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. These should be your friends. You should prefer to hang out with a fellowship with these people. And by the way, as you increase in your faith, it's kind of all tied together because as you increase in your faith, as you perfect your faith, you should not want to, you should have less desire to be in the world or to hang out in that world. It should, it should make you more and more sick all the time. Okay? Look, the holidays are coming up. The holidays are coming up. 
And let me just predict for, for, all, for some of you, I don't, I don't know how many of you, but you are going to be put in positions where you are going to be stuck between these two worlds. Whether it be you know, between the saved and the unsaved, and the world, and the way you're trying to live your life now, and trying to separate. And you're going you're gonna, to, some of you, you're going to go through this time, you're going to go through this time, or you've gone through this time, where you're trying to have one foot here and one foot here. And let me just tell you that as you perfect your faith, you're going to start to realize that you don't want to have that other foot in the, in the world. That's what should happen. And this is a great temptation these times of the holidays when you're, you know, because we're related to people, we have to hang out with people that are against our um, values. We don't have to hang out with people that are against our values, by the way. Amen. All right? But the flip side, the danger of this is this, is that that other foot gets more comfortable than the foot that's here. And it actually damages your faith. Because if you can perfect your faith by your works, you can destroy your faith by your works. You see, it works both ways. The world is dangerous, and these times of year are because of cultures that maybe you grew up with, because of you know, things that positions you, or situations you might be put in, whether it be at work or at home or whatever. Look, the world is dangerous. It's a faith killer. So you need to be careful. And you need to make sure that you've drawn the right lines. Because the Bible says here that you should prefer one another. Okay, it's all tied together with this perfecting of your faith. Romans chapter 7 and verse 13. I'll just read it for you. Was, that what, was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. That's where you want to be. You want to be entrenched in the Word of God so that when you get put in positions, or you, you understand where you need to draw lines so you don't get put in positions. And you can protect your family, your children, your spouse from those types of situations. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. I'm not going to preach a, a sermon tonight on laziness, but this just reminded me of a conversation I had with one of you this week. And I was talking about, you know, I asked uh, one of you this week, I, I was like, hey, you know, how did you start out? How did you start out working? And the story went like this. Well, I started working when I was 15. Uh, I worked my way up in this, in this organization. I became a manager. After that, I realized, hey, you know, God opened a, a door for me. There was an opportunity there. I started my own business. This is, this is, this is not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. This Everybody that works hard, that has made it successfully and is providing for their family has a story like that. And I'm glad to hear stories like that. It's a necessary experience for a man to have a story like that. Look down at verse number 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Does that sound familiar? For tribulation... Work with patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope. Remember that? Distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Now that's difficult. Why did he have to throw that one in there? Everything else seemed pretty, pretty good. Turn to Proverbs 25. Bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. That's hard to do. That's hard to do. He's, just, he's giving all kinds of great advice here. But that's a difficult thing to do, to bless people that persecute you and not curse them. Look at Proverbs 25 and verse number 21. The Bible says, if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. So we're not to repay evil with evil with our personal enemies. Notice how it says, if thine enemy, if your enemy. This is not talking about enemies of God. Yeah. So there's difference in the Bible between enemies of God and your personal enemies. We need to be careful in our lives, by the way, that we don't all of a sudden make every enemy that we have an enemy of God. Don't elevate yourself to the level of God. 
Everyone's not a reprobate just because they don't like you. So we are to bless them that curse us. Verse number 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that do weep. Turn to John 11. Do you feel, let me ask you this, do you feel the pain and joy of your brothers and sisters in Christ? Because if you don't, something's wrong. Turn to John 11. Look at verse 32. This is an interesting story in the Bible. How well do you relate to what your brothers and sisters in Christ are going through? John chapter 11, look at verse 32. Lazarus has just died, who was very close to Jesus. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have they laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Think about that. Super important part of the Bible here. Jesus could have stopped Lazarus from dying, which just didn't have to be there or anything. Remember the Roman centurion's servant? Jesus knew that Lazarus, you know, was in heaven and that he could rise him from the dead. So why did he weep? Think about that. Super important part of the Bible. He wept because he was identifying with the sadness of his sister. And he saw how sad that this sister of Lazarus was. And it, it, he, he identified with her. Super important part of the Bible. Why? Because, because Jesus had emotions. Just like you. And just like me. He wasn't this superhuman, you know, God robot. He was fully man and fully God. Amen. So why is that important? Why is that important? Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Let's look at why that's important. Hebrews chapter 4. There's all kinds of doctrines out there that will attack both the deity of Christ and the manhood of Christ on both sides. And both are important. God was fully, or Jesus was fully man and fully God at the same time. Yeah. Hebrews 4, verse 14. The Bible says, seeing, that, that we have a, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You see? But was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. So we can understand that it's important because we need to understand that Christ went through what we go through in the flesh, yet without sin. He felt all the temptations that you feel. He felt all the sadness that you feel. He felt the physical pain that you feel, yet without sin. That's what you didn't do. Jesus did that. He felt everything the same. He was fully man. This is why these parts of the Bible are here for us to know while going through exactly what we go through he did it without sin he did it perfectly and that's how he could die and take the punishment for your sin because he was innocent and he did it the hard way he didn't come here as superhuman god robot that didn't feel all these things walk through this life with ease and then just die for the sins of the world no he did it just like you except he did it perfectly so that's why it's important that Jesus, you know, felt that. And, but the Bible teaches that. 